Hello. In 1375 in North Africa, after a career beset by imprisonment, intrigue and the murder of his mentor, an ambitious political administrator went to live among the Bedouin. His name was Ibn Khaldun, and when he emerged from the desert four years later, he completed a book which still stands today as one of the great philosophical works dedicated to understanding history. Ibn Khaldun's view of history was bleak, Hardly surprisingly so. He sought to make sense of how the Muslim world seemed to have descended since the triumphs of Muhammad into feuding and decay. He concluded that all political dynasties were doomed to destruction within five generations as their rulers became ever more distanced from their people. Late in life he met the terrifying Mongol conqueror Tamerlane, whose triumphs seemed to bear out his theories. Ibn Khaldun's work had a little impact in his time, but more recent scholars have been astonished to come upon a thinker whose ideas seem to predict much modern political philosophy. With me to discuss the life and ideas of Ibn Khaldun are Robert Irwin, Senior Research Associate of the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, Robert Hoyland, Professor of Islamic History at the University of Oxford, and Hugh Kennedy, Professor of Arabic in the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Hugh Kennedy, can you introduce us to Ibn Khaldun, his, his, his period his, when he was brought up, his time and the society in which he grew up? Yes, he led a long and adventurous life, as well as being a great thinker, born in 1322 to a family that had long lived in Muslim Spain. He could trace his ancestry right back for four or five hundred years. And he was very proud and conscious of his status as, as it were, one of the aristocracy of, of, of the Muslim West. But these were very difficult times. The Christians were conquering more and more territory in Spain. The, the city of Seville, where he, his family originally came from, was now under Christian rule. And so he was compelled to make a career, essentially, in exile, or he was prepared, he had to go around looking for jobs, basically, and he sought jobs in the administration. He was uh, trained in Muslim law, he was trained in um, the, the art of writing letters and documents and so on. So he went from one little court to another in North Africa looking for career opportunities. Can you tell us a bit more about these courts? You went from one court to another. What, can you give us some you know, the gist of that society across that band of North Africa and it stretched across to the Asia Minor and so on? Yes, this was a period when the Muslim world was really in a state of political disintegration. The earlier period of Islamic history when there were caliphates which had ruled over large sections of the Muslim world had disappeared. The last caliph, when uh, Abbasid caliph had been killed, rolled up in a carpet and trampled to death in Baghdad in 1258. There was no longer a centre. Ibn Khaldun felt this very strongly. There was no longer a centre of gravity in the Muslim world. Rather that in each of the, or in many of the little towns in North Africa had their own dynasties, their own courts, running their own administration. And this gave an opportunity for uh, an administrator to, as it were, freelance and to go around from one court to another looking for jobs, looking for really short-term contracts. And Imam Khaldun's experience and his view of history was heavily influenced by the fact, by the insecurities of his own life. No sooner did he seem to find a friend and a patron than the friend and patron got murdered or lost his throne or whatever, and Imam Khaldun was on the road again looking for somebody else to work for. And that gave him a, a really very pessimistic view of history in lots of ways. You can we just for one moment go back to his education, uh, because we've got the Arab, the great uh, Arabic Renaissance in, in in learning, going throughout uh, what we would call our dark ages, uh, not dark for them, an early medieval time. So, what would he have got out of his education? He got a training in uh, Arabic language. He, uh, that's the formal Arabic language. He got a training in Islamic law, which was kind of crucial to doing any sort of administrative job. He certainly read philosophy, uh, read the philosophy of Averroes, for example. Who is it? So there's some sort of training in logic, for instance. There's a training in logic, but Imam Khaldun rather rejected formal logic. Much more, he was much more interested in pragmatic observation of how people work than in in, in theoretical structures of any sort. And uh, so, but he, he he also got a firm education, or gave himself a firm education in Islamic history, in the broad sweep of Muslim history from the time of Muhammad onwards. And he said he'd learned the Quran by heart and he'd learned the art of poetry, which was very uh, important later for eulogistic and supplicatory purposes, wasn't it? Absolutely. Though he's not, he can't be considered a great poet. He, everyone had to do poetry to a greater or less. One of the ways they talked to each other in those days. So Absolutely. It has to be registered. Robert Owen, 
Can we elaborate more on this um, complicated political career? He went from Tunis to Fez, Seville, Granada, Bougie, Biskra, back to Fez, once more to Granada, ended up in Egypt. Can you give us some idea of why he's making these moves and what he's doing? Sometimes he seems to be a prime minister and so on and so on. Um, he's, he's enormously ambitious and really rather arrogant. Uh, he has great, great idea of where he should be. And um, so, for a start, he moves from Tunis, which in those days was a backwater. He, he moves to Fez, which is ruled by the Marinids, and takes service with Abu Inan, the, the ruler there. And um, he's given a job eventually in the Secretariat. And Ibn Khaldun remarks, none of my ancestors did a job as lowly as this. So there's the arrogance coming through. And Abu Inan has given him a job, but very quickly, Ibn Khaldun is intriguing to, uh, w- with a prince who was under house arrest in Fez to, to, to put this prince in charge of Bougie. And uh, Ibn Khaldun's plotting is discovered. He's put in prison, perhaps gave him time to think. Eventually, Abu well, Quite Nan- a while. It was two years, wasn't it? Yes. You can do uh, a lot of thinking in prison in two years if you're, if you're up to it. It's, it's the beginning, perhaps, of his, his great ideas on history. Uh, he's eventually released when Abu Inan is killed and the vizier who releases him. Uh, Ibn Khaldun shows no gratitude to at all. He, he, he sides with the other candidate for the throne, the one that the vizier wasn't supporting. And so it continues. And um, Ibn Khaldun supports a man called uh, Abu Salim and, um, <clears throat> and has this hope that he can train this princeling to become a kind of philosopher king. And it's a recurrent motif in Ibn Khaldun's early political career that that he, he can make a philosopher king on the model of, that had been suggested by earlier Islamic philosophers. Um, what comes over from this career is that he's incredibly ambitious, arrogant and treacherous. He's, he's a great writer, but he's not a very likable man. And he's operating in a, a very violent and turbulent uh, society. Um, Enoch Powell once said all political careers end in failure. In 14th century North Africa, political careers tended to end up with a knifing or a grotting. The, the number of emirs and viziers who, who, went, who died violently is quite extraordinary. It makes it quite difficult to become a successful politician. On the other hand, from what I've read from your notes, he was the equivalent of a prime minister in one quarter or another. He was a diplomat sent out to negotiate with the great Tamburlaine. He, 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 he was on, sent on various missions, including, most importantly, to go into the deserts to talk to the Berber tribes, the Bedouin. So he wasn't... I mean, you're... Am I am I bigging him up when I shouldn't be? But, uh, he, he achieves short-term successes, but it, by the nature of there North wasn't Africa, anything else by the sound of it in those no, times. Indeed, I mean, because you know whatever ruler you sponsored, there's sooner or later going to be a revolt against that ruler, or that ruler is going to get assassinated. So it's very hard for him to establish himself anywhere. Eventually, therefore, he decides to move to Egypt, which is a bit more stable. Can you just give us a, a, a bit more uh, depth on, on his relationship with one political leader, who uh, Ibn Khatib in Granada, and show how that influenced him? So can we just give, get a bit more grip on what he was doing and the time through that relationship? Yeah, uh, after he'd... Um, had a rather turbulent time in North Africa. He does move to Granada, Muslim Spain, and... Um, sort of back near a home, really. Yes, it? and he'd already met Ibn al-Khatib, who'd been a political exile in Morocco, so they already knew each other. And in those days, if you said, well, I've been having dinner with Ibn Khaldun, probably people would say, Ibn who? Whereas Ibn al-Khatib was the man. He was the most famous... Um, scholar and statesman in the Western Islamic world, a very grand writer, a very famous writer, uh, wrote rather good history, very different kind of history from Ibn Khaldun, much more concerned with individuals and motivation and the, the, sort of the, the detailed scenario of, of what was happening, not interested in general laws of history. Ibn al-Khatib was um, the, an admirer of Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Khaldun Similarly, admired Ibn al-Khatib. What was the influence the, the, the greater man had on the rising man? I, I don't know that they, they, they admired each other. I don't, they, they wrote such a different style of history. I don't think it was any actual influence. What happened in Granada was, again, uh, Ibn Khaldun tries to raise a, a princeling in Granada to become the future philosopher king, and he doesn't succeed. And Ibn al-Khatib gets very ratty with Ibn Khaldun, feeling that his influence is being encroached upon. And um, 
Ibn Khaldun for once backs down and, and asks to be sent away, whereupon their friendly relationships resume. Once Ibn Khaldun's back in North Africa, uh, they're corresponding uh, great friendship. They recognise each other as the two top intellectuals. And it's noticeable that when Ibn Khaldun writes his autobiography towards the end of his life, he, he quotes an awful lot of letters from Ibn Khatib uh, f for two reasons. One, Ibn Khatib's a very good writer, and two, it, it's kind of name-dropping. I knew Ibn al-Khatib. Robert Hoyland, I, I'd like to just say more about the political setup there, and we uh, just to try to envisage the courts, how many people were involved, what he's doing, moving from one place to another, so in, because his work in the field was so influential, as Arnold Toynbee admired so much, uh, in, in the way he wrote uh, and what he wrote and what he wrote about history and theory of history. So can we just go on from what Robert Irwin said and talk more about the political setup at the time? Well, the great empires, first of the Almoravids and Mohads in West Africa, have now fallen away, and so we're left with a whole host of small competing dynasties, the Merinids in Fez, the uh, Abdelwadids in Tlemcen, the uh, Hafsids in Tunis, and, as Hugh Kennedy said, even sub-dynasties within that. Lots of the port cities, for example, were held by sub rulers, and there the courts could be really quite basic. You've, you've got very minimal government, really. You need military power, so there's someone in charge of that. You need the basic administration of writing the documents you need and things like that. Are we talking about wealthy courts? Are we talking about places where learning was encouraged and flourished and patronised? Definitely. I mean, although it's portrayed often very negatively, this kind of disintegration of the Muslim world, courts, numerous little courts, in some ways can help um, scholarship, because each ruler, they know what they're meant to be seen as, is a patron of learning, and so they try and attract scholars to them. That tradition continues, even despite the disintegration, because yes, that was a very, very high tradition for centuries, wasn't it? Yeah, very definitely. It leads to a rather funny um, paradox in the Islamic world, where it's precisely often at periods of disintegration. So, for example, when the Abbasid world disintegrates in Iraq, all the lots of little courts pop up of led by little dynasts, and it's actually a period of cultural efflorescence. It's often referred to as the period of Islamic humanism, in the, the 11th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. Also, because Spain is changing, the Christian, different Christian rulers are trying to infiltrate and take more control of Muslim areas. And so a number of Muslim scholars are thinking, well, this, the winds are going against us, and they actually go back to Africa, and they are looking for courts, for, for patronage. When we say patronage, we're looking, talking about you know, a salary, maybe a teaching job at a college, or grants of land. For example, Ibn Khaldun in Egypt was given um, a farm in fi the Fayum Oasis near Cairo just to be able to support him. So, you know, looking at, at a livelihood that will keep you going, be able to practice your scholarship, be able to write in peace, and so on. We've been, been, he's been described quite vividly as this intriguer, the treacherous person, this man, as it were, and by the sound of it, rightly imprisoned for stabbing people in the back. Or, um, mm. Was that, was he thought, would that be a typical of the time, or was he outstandingly treacherous, intriguing, etc.? I wouldn't really agree with the term treacherous. He's simply ambitious. Uh, an Egyptian colleague remarks of how he adored public office. And He's certainly oh, an, oh, him Cald Caldun, him, yeah. yes. and he's certainly an opportunist, uh, the example Robert Irwin gave when the vizier al Hassan in Omar gets him out of prison. Another sultan comes along, Mansur Ibn Suleiman, kicks out the vizier, but Ibn Khaldun doesn't go to the defence of the vizier. He quickly joins up with the new sultan. But in a situation which Hugh Kennedy described, where you really have so many courts that and so much intriguing, basically you've got to look out for yourself to some extent. So he's a, an astute survivor, I would put it as. He but also a grand old age, doesn't he? 75 or 76. I that's right, yes. Very but unusual also, by the sound of it. <laughs> yes. But I suppose also when... Um, he, he comes from a very important and long-established bureaucratic family, so he has his family reputation to think of. And this is a world where land ownership doesn't provide for elites. There isn't a kind of continuity of land ownership. So what's kind of... The, your main capital as an elite family is your knowledge 
and education and your ability to put your offspring into positions of power and they it's their duty to kind of maintain that so trying to stay and get up in high office is extremely important now very significantly very significantly from around 1365 he was sent on missions to the berber tribes in the north african sahara desert now this was very important for him can you briefly explain why because we'll be going into that in some detail uh, well, he's brought in in different ways. Um, I mean, he seems to have... He doesn't explain how, but a number of different sultans commission him to do uh, kind of propaganda work to bring the tribes on side. It's important for the leaders because it gives them military manpower for trying to prosecute their various wars. It makes Ibn Khaldun into a very important power broker. A lot of sultans later on are seeking his services in that direction so whether that's important in, it, in and of itself to him, that he actually can set, portray himself as a major power broker for them he obviously uses these relations when he wants his period of sabbatical and he's got a bit fed up with all the politicking and he goes off for four years to write his great muqaddima um, he's able to find refuge with a particular Bedouin clan and he left alone in their protection. You need protection in these more desert tribes especially, so potentially that's important. But his autobiography doesn't exactly make it clear. Hugh Kennedy, um, but he did, a few years later in 1375, as it were, withdraw from public life, uh, as far as I've read from the, from the notes, and wrote his history of the Arabic world and also his philosophy of history, the Mukaddima. Um, and... The Berbers, the Bedouin, were very important to that. So why did he suddenly leave public life? We have a two-track Ibn Khaldun from now until the rest of this conversation, the great scholar, although unrecognised in his time, and the man who's still intriguing, knocking around from court to court and so on. So but have, have we anything that tells us why he took this big chunk of time out of, a, out of an ambitious life to go into the desert with, with a particular tribe and write these books? I think he'd been thinking about it for some time. I think, like lots of intellectuals, he lived in this sort of fantasy, if only I could get away from all this everyday stuff and just hide myself away, I'm going to write a great book. But and, he did. And he did, <laughs> unlike <laughs> lots of other people. He, he, he made it. And, um, but then, in the end, the lure of, of, of the wide world comes back and, you know, the four years yeah, is enough. Is thing, he, first of all, is why did he go there then? What took him there then? Before he comes back, let's get him there. He went away for over three years and wrote this book in a remote plot in the desert. So, can we do anything? Can well, we flesh that out? He was in his early 40s. He'd had quite a lot of experience of the world and I think he felt exactly that he needed a sabbatical. He had these ideas. And the Muqaddimah seems to have been written very fast. It's not written in particularly finely tuned Arabic. It's, it seems to have been written very fast, and he himself speaks of the ideas just pouring out of his, his mind and so on. He, he scribbles, scribbles, scribbles. You know, he has to get it down, um, and he's very excited by these ideas, clearly. He's, he's worked out what he wants to say. And I think it's just a, a career choice, if you like, at that moment. Can we then, Robert Owen, move into, into, into the writing? Uh, and I want to keep the Bedouin and the desert in mind because it seems to me from, from, that, that that becomes very important to him. So we've got to, hit, first of all, talk briefly about him as an historian, because get that out of the way, and then, and then as a, a, a philosopher of ideas. As a historian, he wrote... Well, you, you tell me. <coughs> he wrote... Um First, and what he's most famous for, the Mukadima, or the Prolegomenon, Prolegomon, the introduction to his big history. And that's his most exciting work, where he explores what is plausible in history, how the laws of history work, how societies rise and decline. He followed this up with a, a massive history, the Kitab al Ibar, which, is a, which he originally conceived of as a history of... Uh, uh, North Africa, of, of the Berbers and Arabs in the, the region of Morocco, Tunisia and Algeria, but subsequently expanded it to a world history. And he finally follows this up with a kind of autobiographical memoir come history, which he wrote in Egypt, where he details his, his, account, with, his account of his meeting with Tamerlane. Um, <clears throat> I think what is important about it, we, we can't go on talking about Ibn Khaldun without registering the fact that Ibn Khaldun lived through the Black Death, it gave him a sense that things had changed, that society, that the world before the Black Death was very different from the world after. He, he lost a great number of his family as he well. Lost, he lost his parents, he lost most of his teachers, uh, 
towns and villages were deserted. It, it had a devastating effect. Um, and it, 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 it gives Ibn Khaldun's philosophy of history a rather pessimistic tone, but it also gives me the sense that societies are different at different times. It's very obvious to us as modern historians, but uh, his peers and predecessors among Islamic historians tended to write as if 9th century Baghdad was very much the same as 14th century Baghdad, that things never changed very much. But Ibn Khaldun had this sense that, yes, things had changed and they would continue to change, and he, he was writing precisely a moment of great change. And one of the things that comes out in the margins of his Mukaddama is that uh, the, the, the bases of power are moving away from where they had been in the Islamic world to the north. Now, it's not clear what he meant by the north. He may have meant, uh, may have meant Europe, where the, you know, the, 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 the Reconquista is taking place and the Muslims are losing ground in Andalusia and so on, and <clears throat> the, the, Europe is making great technological technological changes and so on. Or he may have meant the Ottomans. Uh, the Ottoman um, sultan is still in its early stages, but he may have been aware of that. So, Robert Hoyland, he, he, he wrote this uh, great and quite rare history, which included the Berbers and so on. Um, and then he developed the fear of history, which you all want to get onto. This is a thing that he is uh, most lauded for, remembered for, and as centuries went on, became more influential. So let's talk about this theory of history. In the book. What is he saying, and what's he saying that's new? First of all, what's he saying? What's startling new, new in the first words, actually, is that the object of history is knowledge of social organisation. This... He, he plays up the fact that no-one's thought of this before in his, the Islamic world, and he's right, really. It, it's certainly not a, a sort of social, sociological aspect to history. I mean, history has been what God not. did through men before then. He, God is interestingly left out of it. It's not that he isn't religious, he acknowledges God, Quran, he's very knowledgeable in Islamic law, but God doesn't play a part in history. The centre is man. One of the key concepts is this word asabiyya, which gets generally translated group feeling or social cohesion. It's the real cornerstone of his work. Group feeling leads to uh, another word, uh, mulk, which gets translated as royal authority. It really just means kingship or rule. But all sorts of rule, group feeling is necessary for it, and it, it will lead towards it. And royal authority can't exist without it. It needs it to get started. Can we develop Asabir? Because that seemed to be very central. As you say, core to him. I mean, if I'm right, I'm harping on about this a bit, but uh, this is what he found when he went into the desert with the Berbers and the Bedouin, didn't he? Yeah, it's the most... He's a very good sociologist of his world because the, the, str the cities are in a very narrow strip along the coast. The Sahara Desert... It's huge, the Atlas Mountains, vast areas where tribal organisation is the norm. That is, self-help groups that are based, whether really or fictively, on kinship. And solidarity, this tribal solidarity, the asabiya, the group feeling, that's what binds them together. It allows them to live in the desert. He says no tribes, no one can exist in the desert without this group feeling. It's necessary for people must help each other to live in this difficult environment. It gives them military strength. It gives them virtue. He actually gives it a very... It becomes equivalent to kind of virtuous in the Roman sense. And, and also he said it's partly because they were very close together. No man was earning more than any other man. They were very much a group. He, can you tell us a bit more about why he admired just because they... It wasn't just because they could survive in the back end of the Atlas Mountains. It was because of the way they worked as a unit, wasn't it? Yes, it seemed to, the simplicity of the, their life as he saw it seemed to appeal to him, whether as in cities, people are so much worrying about their own worldly desires and desire for luxury and so on, that it, it just leads to corruption of any group feeling. There is no asabiya group feeling in cities. You're only going to get it in the desert, and it's obviously something that really impressed him. And to him, it, it is reality, because he actually has a, another principle, which is very important, was it mutabaka, that your historical ideas should bear relation to reality. And to him, this is what he saw, that the tribes are coming and going, taking over cities. Unfortunately, they themselves get weakened by this terrible rib desire for luxury and worldly desires and in their turn they collapse but, so, um, so can we develop, can we take this further on uh, Hugh Kennedy, he saw dynasties declining, he had this, this idea that it took five generations, he hammered away at the number five, 
Can you just say how this happened? And, and uh, Robert Hollins pointed out that they came in like wolves from the desert and ended up as sheep in the cities, as it were. So. Fundamental to Ibn Khaldun's view of human nature is the idea that people are shaped by their environment. I think that this, and that uh, was radical at the time. Yes. Um, that underpins his whole view of human nature. And the, the, the Bedouin have this asabir, as, as, as Robert was just saying now, because of their desert environment. And he argues that this is necessary for the creation of the dynasty. But after the dynast, as it were, takes over a city and establishes a settled state, he becomes distanced from the Bedouin, the tribesmen who had put him in power, and so to speak. And they either get seduced by the luxuries of, of, of the city and lose, over two or three generations, lose their Bedouin, um, their Bedouin strength, if you like, um, or they drift away from the dynasty and go back to the Bedouin life and are lost to the dynasty in that sort of way. And inevitably, the dynast, the, the ruler, starts to employ professional soldiers, professional bureaucrats. There's no longer this um, body of people sharing this asabiyah in support of the dynasty. And he paints a very interesting and ca uncannily accurate uh, portrayal of how the first... The first ruler is the tough, hardy man from the desert. The second ruler is the man this who is established... This is when they conquered and moved into yes. the cities, yes. And the second one, the second ruler is the man who, who sets up the bureaucracy and so on. The third ruler is the man who starts to enjoy the luxury and begins not to pay attention to politics anymore. And distances himself from the group, which means that he loses contact with the idea of Asibir. Exactly. And he uh, relies on... You know, courtiers who will tell him what he wants to hear and on, on bureaucrats who have their own interests to look after. And then in the fourth and fifth generation, the rulers he says, essentially abandon themselves to luxury and display. They've lost touch with the sort of reality that brought them to power. And inevitably, and this is, I think, key to the way he thinks, inevitably this dynasty will collapse and be replaced by another group with their new newly forged Asabir, if you like, coming into the town with a new ruler, and so the whole cyclical, cyclical, cyclical process will go on from one generation to another. Sorry, Robert, I mean, to, to what extent is he drawing on, on existing um, Middle Eastern and North African history to reach these conclusions? Yeah, uh, he's, he's not drawing on history writing. He's original in that sense. But the model he's formed of the rise and decline of dynasties um, coming out from the desert and invading cities and then becoming um, civilised and then uh, decadent is very much patterned on what had been happening in North Africa uh, from particularly in the 12th and 13th centuries with first the Elm Almoravids and then the Almohads and then the Merinids, successive dynasties that come in from the desert, take over the cities and then slowly decay uh, uh, in the cities. I think it's a very moralistic view of, of, of history that, you know, the dynasties decline because of extravagance, pride, luxury and so on. It, 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 it's a rather pious version of history, I think. I think there's a lot of religion in Ibn Khaldun's version of history. Um, the thing... One of the factors that leads to uh, the decay of dynasties once they occupy the cities is that the tribes that have come in settle in the towns um, and they lose the Asabir. And so the ruler can no longer rely on that tribe for, for military strength and therefore the ruler is forced to hire mercenaries and that's very expensive and therefore he has to raise more taxes. And uh, Ibn Khaldun's a, a supply-side e economist. He, he believes that it's bad to remove money for the ruler to remove money from the economy into his treasury. Um, that leads to a diminishment of wealth for... It's it's a great in the long run, it's, the it's bad wealth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of primitive Keynesianism. Mm. Can I just come back to... to let, let's stress, because there's great talk in your writings of his originality, his radicalism. We're talking about the 14th century. Uh, this originality and radicalism wasn't recognised for three or four centuries, and then only in the 19th century he got going... To what extent, therefore, Hugh Kennedy, can we talk about, did he draw on previous thinkers, the Aristotle and, and Averroes, the Andalusian uh, Muslim philosopher, and even Plato? Well, he did to an extent. He's certainly aware of these writings, but he's also very consciously, self-consciously new. This is one of the things that marks him out from many of his predecessors, who, who would say, oh, we're continuing the great tradition of, 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 of history writing. He says, I'm doing something completely new. Nobody's thought of this before. And... Is he right? Yes, more or less. I mean, particularly um, the 
emphasis on environment as a determining factor in human behaviour, I think, and that people are inevitably shaped by their environment, I think is, 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 is a very new idea. And his, his discussion of the Bedouin is particularly interesting. He's very conflicted almost in his view of the Bedouin. There's a sort of noble savage almost element in his view of them. They, they live this tough, hardy life. They've got all the virtues of people who live in a, in, a, in a harsh environment. They cultivate the loyalty because that's necessary for survival, as we've just been hearing. On the other hand, he says the Bedouin are extremely destructive. And he says, very interesting passage, you only have to look at North Africa, all these ruined cities and so on. Who is responsible for that? The Bedouin. And whenever Bedouin come to power, they... They have no interest in cultivation. They just steal things and break things up and smash things up and generally cause mayhem. So it's it's very well, not nuanced view really. It's a very I think very divided view about what these people are uh, their strengths and their weaknesses. Robert Hoyland, can you take that on? You you raise your hand, but uh, and take tell us a bit more about his theory of good political leadership. But first it's, of all, what you were going to say? Well, yourself. I wanted to make a point because it's not really. Uh, played up in the secondary literature, because Hugh Kennedy is totally right, there is a, a very new element to his thinking. But he's very aware of the old, and there's a, there's a huge tradition of Islamic political writing and writing about the way kingship and rule works in Islam. And he has to deal with that, and he does it in an extremely clever way, because both terms, asabir and mulk, are very negative in actually Islamic political theory. Asabir is actually partisanship, when tribes a law to their tribes and not to the ruling dynasty. Mulk is kingship. It's bad because it's contrasted to khalifa, which is caliphal rule. Caliphal rule is by Islamic principles. It's joined with religion, whereas mulk is earthly rule. It's, it's dynasty, it's family members succeeding each other rather than the election of the best person and so on. So how does he deal with this? Because he sees mulk as a very positive thing to which people aspire, as they should do. And what he does is he says that Mulk is leadership by rational insight to help people in this earthly world, whereas Khalifa is leadership by religious insight to help them for the other world. What happens in the beginning then, because he has to deal with the first caliphs, this is, of Medin and caliphs, this is crucial, he says that, yes, in their time they were... Khalifas, they were proper caliphs, they ruled in this more religious way. But they could only do this by rejecting the outer world. Omar famously very walked around in rags, didn't have a treasury and so on. They kind of kept it out, but this couldn't go on. So when Ma'awiyah, he says very explicitly, defeats Ali, he might have been wrong, but he was doing what was had to happen. Mulk could be the only way forward, what gets translated as royal authority. He had, when he appoints his son, everyone sees it as bad, but it had to happen for Mulk to continue. And he gives the defence that otherwise the whole venture of Islam would have collapsed. Can we just nail this one, Hugh Kennedy, before we move on? Would you, would you, could he be described as, as a, a religious thinker? No. I mean, well, I, I think that the, the, the yeah. Robert Owen may be about describing me. Um, I, I think not. I think what he's striking about is his thought is it, it's moralistic, to be sure, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very secular morality, what works and what doesn't. I think he has a very Hobbesian view, if you like, of human society. You need strong authority or people will go around Nasty, doing bad brutal, things to each other. Short, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah mm-hmm. exactly. So I, I think that the, what we've just been hearing about, the necessity of, more, the necessity of political authority, and therefore anybody who can as well, assert this authority and make it work should be, should be supported. So Hobbes' idea, 200 years later, that life was nasty, brutish, ugly and short, therefore we had to get together to have one holding force, the Leviathan, was already present in his work there. But you wanted to say something about his religious... Yes, religious I, I, th- I, I think he is a religious thinker. I think religion is primary. It, it's not obvious, but it is primary in Ibn Khaldun's writing. He, he was an extremely pious Maliki Muslim. He was a Sufi, like Ibn al-Khatib. And um, he, when he writes about Asabir, he, he writes about it in quite a positive sense. But that's because Asabir is God's way of moving society along. God underpins everything that happens in history, and there is a divine purpose to history. And also, um, when he's writing about these tribes that invade settled society, they, they can set up, they can conquer, and they can set up dynasties, but the most successful ones, the only really successful ones, are ones who not only have asabir, but also have deen, religion. And this obviously applies to the 
early Islamic conquests in the 7th century, but also applies to the Almoravids and Almohads, who had quite a relig- strong religious agenda. He actually sees Islam as a way of the way these tribes got out of being uh, centred just on themselves and came together and made them a, a, could make them a great sweeping force. Is that right? Yes, and a prophet or a religious leader was was necessary for the most successful movements because it because a, a prophet or a religious leader brought the tribes or brought tribes people together and uh, as it were undermined or replaced their ancient rivalries. I think. That, Late in his life he went to Egypt, which he thought was a wonderful place, and he became a judge there, and he had a coherent theory of justice, as as, as one might expect. What did he find in Egypt that that almost contradicted some of the things he'd been saying in his previous, in his his already written theories? I'm not sure someone mentioned this coherent theory of justice. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, he applied... He was very rigorous, as he saw it, in his autobiography, in his application of just proper Islamic... Law and this seems to have got him into trouble because he wouldn't accept, for example, the intercession of um, notables and high officials. And very quickly, he was kicked out of office by a kind of concerted group of lobbyists to the Sultan. He does have in the Muqaddimah a number of points at which he stresses that in unjust rule is bad for civilization. If a ruler acts in a kind of arbitrary way, if he seizes people's property and land, if in particular he uses forced labour, which is particularly bad because he sees labour as a, a free man's source for making a living. Um, so unjust, unjust behaviour in that sense is to be avoided. Sorry, Robert. You want to... Robert Irwin. Um, <clears throat> what he found in Egypt was something quite new, fairly new to him. He must have known it from a distance, but he's brought up directly with the Mamluk regime. And the Mamluk system works by recruiting slaves from the South Russian steppes, uh, uh, Turks, and training them to be slave soldiers. And so there's a continuous meritocracy of of new slaves being brought in and being promoted to become generals and administrators. And Ibn Khaldun thought this was rather marvellous because you've got the Asabir, because these people have been have been children in the tribe in tribes and the steppes, and then they're educated together and they get a kind of asabir in the barracks from fighting together and training together. And Ibn Khaldun seems to th- thought he doesn't spend much time on it, but he seems to have thought that the Mamluks the Mamluk regime had found a way of avoiding the inevitable cycle of rise and decline. Um, the other big thing about his time in Egypt, it, partly it was a much safer place to be than Tunis or Fez, or is, is it had big libraries and much, it had much more resources and there were far more scholars in, in Egypt. And indeed, scholars tended to migrate from North Africa or Iraq to, to, to Egypt. So it was a much more stimulating, much more scholarly place. Um, then he, he, he met the... Uh, we can't, we can't, in 1401, he, he negotiated with, as I understand, the Mongol uh, conqueror Tamerlane. Can you tell us about that here? Yes, he'd gone to Damascus to negotiate. Tamerlane was inv- based in Iran, um, but was invading Syria. And, and he swept right across. Yes, from right yes and he conquered there. Aleppo, and he's outside the walls of Damascus, and Ibn Khaldun goes out to negotiate with him. And What was he going to negotiate? I mean, this man well, had sort of gone thousands of miles, and, what, and Ibn Khaldun's going out to say, what's he going to say? Will you stop? He wants to arrange the peaceful surrender of Damascus, and yeah. he makes himself quite unpopular within the city because there are people who want to hold out. That does seem to be and, a distinguishing characteristic, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> Repeating. Well, judging by what motif. happened to people who resisted Tamerlane, it was a sensible, a, a sensible and prudent option. Yeah. So he goes out to see him, and he... T- be through an interpreter, but he gives him, according to Ibn Khaldun at least, uh, rather charmingly, a sort of history lesson. And he talks about Asabi and all his ideas of history to the great man, who seems to appreciate it and is generous to him and so on. It's a slightly sort of self-serving account in a way, but it, it, does, he, it does make the point that as an intellectual, he's got something to offer the great conqueror. He can talk about history. And he says, oh, you want to know about this? Well, let's go and read the great history of Tabari and things like that, the great early Islamic history, and find out about these things. So it gives them a little history lesson, a little seminar on political power and so on. And in the end, for all sorts of different reasons, Tamerlane withdrew from Damascus and he had other problems on to, to, to deal with. And Ibn Khaldun goes back to Cairo and tells everybody about it. Robert Hoyland, can we just briskly, I'm afraid, because uh, we're running out of time. His ideas capture the imagination of the European intelligentsia. Let's let's move right to the 19th century with Auguste Comte. Why did he take these ideas up? So and and they've swum further and further into the centre of the pool ever since. 
I suppose it was because European sociology also started with this question of social cohesion. It's felt at the time Auguste Comte is writing, particularly Durkheim, that their societies are being more challenged. Uh, the old, old sort of traditions that are holding society together are changing. And so it's a question, what, what does hold people together? And this is exactly the question that Ibn Khaldun's dealing with. So this rather captured the imagination. And he developed toy... Uh, sorry, Robert, Robert Owen. Um, just, there's another part to the background. It's very striking that it's the French who take up Ibn Khaldun yeah. in the early, mid-19th century. It's the French who first edit him and the French who first translate him. And part of the background to that, I think, is the French invasion of Algeria in 1830 and then the move into Morocco subsequently. So the French scholars and administrators are very preoccupied with how to manage Berbers and Arabs in North Africa. And Ibn Khaldun seems to provide a, a ground plan for them to work from. How does his reputation rest now, Hugh Kennedy? I think his reputation rests very high, and he's particularly been rediscovered by uh, Arab Muslim intellectuals in really since the Second World War, and a lot of Muslim scholars have been working on him, and they see in a sense his career and his writing is, is a refutation of this idea that, um, that medieval Islam ran out of ideas and ran out of creative genius and they can always point to Ibn Khaldun and say, look, this great thinker was produced very, as a very, very late in the golden age of Islam, so to speak, in, in, in the 14th, early 15th centuries. So he's a useful corrective to, um, to Western denigration of but the creativeness to, of it. Just to recap the headline, he was he was without doubt way ahead of his ahead of his time in what he would say. Robert Irwin shaking his head a bit. You agree? <laughs> oh, agree. Oh, it's the shaking head that agrees. Is he, 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 was a, he was a one-off. I think it's. I'm not sure whether the head or, or it's, it's necessarily the right word, but he was a one-off, a very individual thinker with a very clear and distinctive view of human society and its evolution. Well, thank you very much, Hugh Kennedy.